So on to tonight's presentations, which everybody's been waiting for. Um, I thank you. Want to thank uh, Marcel um, Steiber for uh, very much for uh, joining us tonight. Uh, Marcel uh, is AI6 MS, and he's been an amateur radio operator since uh, 2008. Um, while he was, um, sorry, I just lost my uh, my notes here. Sorry, I stole the screen from you. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. <laughs> Well, uh, so while he was attending Cal uh, California Polytechnic uh, State University in San Luis Obispo, he was president of uh, Cal Poly Amateur Radio Club, uh, W6BHZ, and is currently the industry advisor to the club. Uh, he graduated with a master's degree in electrical engineering, concentrating on RF and communications, and writing his thesis on radio direction finding, network receiver design for low-cost public service applications. Marcel works as a senior hardware systems engineer at Amazon Labs 126 in Sunnyvale, California, and also serves on Cal Poly Electrical Engineering Industry Advisory Board. He's an assistant emergency coordinator for the city of Cupertino, which I know is a very active uh, ham radio um, uh, city and county. Uh, and he serves as the trustee and technical lead for the Cupertino Aries UHF repeater, which is W6TDM and is the project lead for the Cupertino, Cupertino Aries uh, ArcNet project, which is building up high-speed wireless internet for the emergency responders in Cupertino. Uh, Marcel regularly volunteers as a local repeater um, uh, workdays as an RF technician and tower climber and enjoys providing communications for location uh, bike rides and tri triathlons. He's also volunteers as technical advisor to several event management companies and a local repeater group. He is an AWRL life member and has helped license over 733 hams since 2009 and has recently become involved in organizing fully remote license exam sessions, uh, which we hope to do also here in Portland. So with, without further ado, I'm going to uh, give it over to Marcel. Thank you very much, Max, for the... <laughs> the <laughs> Warm welcome in the full bio. That's on my QRZ page. Um, thanks very much, everyone. Uh, hopefully the audio is good. Uh, this is my presentation this evening on lithium batteries. Um, I've given most of the intro already, or I guess Max did, so we don't need to cover that. Uh, just a couple of Zoom meeting recommendations. Uh, generally, stay on mute. I think everyone already is. Uh, mostly, uh, if you want to have your cameras on, that's helpful because then I can kind of see your reactions. And if you have questions or if you're falling asleep, we can move on. Um, please do ask questions into the uh, into the chat window from Zoom, and we'll try to get to those during during the meeting. And any comments as well. If I'm speaking too quickly, uh, if I'm speaking, if you want me to repeat something, uh, feel free to just drop it into um, the chat. Uh, the first question in the chat: uh, the meeting is being recorded. Um, I already have a recording of the previous uh, or first time I gave this talk uh, back at Pacificon two years back or a year ago. Um, so that's available already on my QRZ, and I uh, will likely be posting this one as well as an update to that because I have quite a few new slides in uh, today's presentation. Um, so you got the intro, so I think we can skip this entire slide, um, but we'll talk about the abstract. So this evening, uh, we're going to talk about batteries. Um, I'm going to give a brief background on batteries, talk about lead acid batteries, uh, then talk on lithium batteries in generally, and then focus on the particular uh, battery of interest for amateur radio, which is lithium iron phosphate batteries. So we'll discuss kind of the pros and cons of each type of chemistry, uh, common misuses and uses of them, um, and everyday applications for 12 volt amateur radio projects. So this is a bi-directional QSO, so please do ask questions, um, drop them in the chat, um, and I'll have a couple slots too to ask for questions for anyone that wants to on the call. Alrighty, so let's jump right in. Uh, so intro to batteries. So batteries are fundamentally an electrochemical energy storage. So that means that they're trading electrons through chemistry um, to store and provide electrical potential to run our radios, right? So ultimately, this is to run radios. That's the only reason we have batteries. Um, they're constructed in layers. Um, uh, as you can see on the right here, that's one of the original uh, pile batteries from Alessandro Volta in the early 1800s, where they used uh, piles of zinc, brine-soaked paper, and copper which creates your anode, your electrode, and your cathode. The, elect the electrolyte, sorry, the electrolyte being the brine-soaked paper. So that's actually the ion exchange between the zinc surface and the copper surface. Um, and if you think about the layers in those batteries, 
if you look at the bottom of the slide, you'll see that's, of course, a schematic symbol for a battery. And you may notice that it is plates on top of plates, very much like that battery that you see on the right, right? So very like down to the schematic level, batteries are composed of layers with an anode and a cathode, and that provides a voltage, okay? So that's like fundamental 101 that we need to remember. Now, along with that voltage, you have what's known as a nominal cell voltage. And this is really important because this is where the chemistry comes into play. For a specific type of chemistry and a type of battery, you'll have a different nominal cell voltage. So your standard everyday, um, you know, uh, AA battery, AAA battery, the alkaline batteries are carbon zinc. And a carbon zinc electrode combination gives you a 1.5 volt nominal cell voltage. Similarly, NiCAD batteries have a 1.2 volt, which is why they can kind of be used to replace alkaline batteries, but don't always give you quite the range that you'd expect or quite the same amount because they're at a slightly lower voltage. So some radios, for example, if you use that six AA battery pack and put the NiCADs in there, it'll yell at you right away and say the batteries are low because the actual voltage it's expecting is 6 times 1.5 as opposed to 6 times 1.2, right? So that's really interesting. And then lead acid batteries, 2.1 volts nominal cell voltage. We'll get to that in a moment. So for the purposes of today's talk, we're really talking about what we call, you know, 12 volt DC radio systems, which are designed off of this kind of mobile radio spec, which is your automotive kind of battery power, which is nominally kind of 13.8 volts, plus or minus 15%. That's the standard kind of typical specification that you'll see for HF radios, for mobile radios, and for most electronics that can work in a car, they'll have at least that kind of voltage input range, but that's really the target that we're going for. So in order to get to that 12 volts, obviously you actually need to do some stacking of batteries. So in the bottom right here, this is the inside of a nine volt battery. Um, they do come in different styles, but this is one of the two common styles. And you'll notice again, it has these plates in it. And if we're all very smart and we can look at that, we can count that there are six sets of plates and it's a carbon zinc battery. So it's six sets of one and a half volts, which gets you nine volts, right? So it's really beautiful how the math just works out. And that's why that is a nine volt battery, right? So that's one of my favorite little things. And yes, go take apart a dead nine volt battery at home. You'll either find it like this with the pile construction or it'll have the quadruple A, it'll have six quadruple A batteries in there, which are each 1.5 volts and they're wired in series. So that's kind of neat. All right, so that's all for the intro. Um, so we'll jump right into lead acid batteries. So uh, these were invented in like 1859 is the date I have on my slide. Um, and in order to get to that 12 volts, we have six sets of uh, plates to give you six cells in series. The chemistry that they're using is actually pure lead on one side and lead oxide on the other with the sulfuric acid to actually um, carry the ions between the two sides. So on the left there, you see a picture a cross section of an automotive battery that's probably a smaller like motorcycle battery. Um, and you can see again, there are six chambers, um, each filled with a bunch of um, soaked pads that provide the nominal cell voltage. And by tying them all together in series, like the photo on the right, you can see the bus bars here that are connecting it in series. You get your nominal kind of 12 volts, right? So when we connect uh, all these 2.1 volt cells together, that gets you to 12.6 volts when you have six cells. Um, and then you have this kind of max and min voltage of the cells when they're fully charged or fully discharged. Um, for a 2.1 volt lead, lead acid primary cell, your typical minimums are somewhere like 1.3 to 1.8 and all the way up to like 2.35 or 2.45. So for a lead acid battery, the ranges you'll typically see are kind of in the 10.8 volt range to 14.2. Um, when we plot that out uh, and kind of map that against our 13.8 volt nominal range that we're looking for for our 12 volt system, um, we can see that we kind of run into a problem where already just from partial discharge of this battery, it very quickly drops below um, our lower 15%. And we'll get into that a little bit more later, but that's one of the big drawbacks of lead acid is that you can't use its full capacity for most 12 volt radio systems. Um, the chart here on the bottom is an interesting one. This is a discharge graph which shows you at different C rates for a specific 12 volt battery, um, the actual runtime and the available capacity changes pretty significantly. So lead acid batteries are designed for low C rates, which means if it's like a 10 amp hour lead acid battery, a 0.1 C rate would be one amp of discharge, which then should run for 
roughly 10 hours. You can see that here, right? But as soon as it crosses the red line, the red line is where the 13.8 volt radio would stop working. So if that radio is actually running at 10 amps on that battery, you would only get you know, 15 minutes of runtime on that same battery. So it's a really interesting uh, trade-off. And these are very helpful when you're sizing batteries for different scenarios. So lead acid comes in two major types. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I want to get to lithium. But generally, there's sealed format and there's flooded. Um, sealed lead acid batteries are the most common ones that you find everywhere. Um, they come in a couple different types as well, AGM, gel cell, and deep cycle. Um, and flooded, uh, is like this one here in the bottom right, this is a large 200 amp hour um, system for a public safety uh, repeater system. Um, and that's flooded electrolyte. So these have to be stationary. They have to be earthquake safe so they don't tip over and, and spill anything. Um, and it's actually interesting, you'll notice each of these um, cells is one primary cell. So again, we have six of these in series to get our total 12 volt system, um, 12 times 2.1, or sorry, six times 2.1 volts to get that 12.6 volt nominal system. Um, and those often have very long battery life, but they do require more maintenance as well. So pros and cons, lead acid is very sensitive to deep discharge. Um, so you really can't deliver this full rated capacity for 12 volt radios. There's a lot of uh, existing material on it online uh, and a lot of cycle testing that people have done. But if you use more than 50% of the available capacity of lead acid battery, you get very limited by the cycle life and the batteries will die very quickly. So with a 50% depth of discharge, so that means for a 10 amp hour battery, if you use five amp hours worth of capacity, you only get 500 cycles before that battery is effectively um, end of life. So that, that's a challenge. The other one is they're heavy. They have the word lead in them. So they have a low gravimetric en energy density, um, which means the weight versus um, energy is very, a very poor ratio. Um, and most of the sealed lead acid types have only a five-year shelf life, which actually becomes a problem. Um, most of us ham radio operators like to have our batteries in like long-term service, or we want to put them at a radio site and we want to keep them on float service. Uh, they, they generally need to get replaced every five years because that's just how long the chemistry lasts and the manufacturer usually doesn't warranty them beyond that, um, if even that long. Car batteries might only get warrantied for a few years, um, not even that five-year time frame. Um, but they're cheap and readily available, so they're really easy to get your hands on, uh, but your total cost of ownership can be high, right? So if you go to uh, Home Depot, for example, and go pick up uh, you know, a little seven amp hour lead acid battery, which they do carry for uh, things like automatic gate openers for, um, for farms and, and, and such, uh, check the dates on them. Oftentimes those batteries have been manufactured two years ago, which means you're actually paying full price for a battery that's already 40% used. Right, so that's something to just keep an eye on that when you're going shopping for batteries, make sure you're getting them from a reputable manufacturer and that they are actually new. So manufactured in you know, like the last six months or something when you receive them, otherwise uh, ask for a discount because uh, that'll just, it's the time that's ticking away from the day you get them. Um, the nice thing about lead acid, you can hook them directly up to your radio. So the radio is just accept the voltage. Um, it'll sometimes drip too low, but you won't have any over voltage. You can use regular chargers for automotive. They're all over the place. You can buy these battery tenders um, and tons of charge controllers and everything available to just make them really usable. So um, lead acid batteries, super, super easy. A uh, show of hands, how many people have a lead acid battery in service for some radio thing or have one at home? Yeah, like half the crowd probably. So that's <laughs> that's kind of, they're, they're just there, right? I'm using them at, uh, I guess, two of my repeater sites that I have running um, have lead acid batteries at them and all of my ArcNet sites have lead acid batteries at them. So it's still very, very common um, and they, they're used everywhere. Uh, so a typical block diagram, I just, I pull this straight from West Mountain Radio and I pull it very particularly because I wanna make one addendum to it. So they're typical setup for like a battery backup system. Um, you have a 12 volt power supply, um, you have the battery and then you have the radio or the load and then they have some sort of load transfer mechanism. Um, the Super Power Gate PG40S, that's a really common one that's uh, seen all over the place. I have it um, deployed at quite a few of my sites. Um, it works well, uh, but it's uh, very lossy because it's just a diode or bridge effectively with a built-in uh, lead acid charger. So it's pretty capable, um, but it's not very efficient. And the one thing it's missing is an under voltage protection for your battery. So we mentioned earlier that the lead acid batteries are super sensitive to over discharge. Um, if you've ever run your car battery to zero and not been able to start, it pretty much means it's time to replace the battery because that can irreversibly damage it. 
Uh, so it's really critical that you have some sort of under voltage lockout protection. Um, this can be the $150 Power Guard Plus that West Mountain Radio also very conveniently um, sells to you, uh, or it can be a cheaper module off eBay with a relay and some configurable voltage settings for it, uh, which I use for like my motorcycle battery uh, to prevent that from getting over discharge from my radio. So that's critical. If there's one thing you learn from today, make sure your batteries have low voltage protection in them so you don't um, destroy them when they get discharged too much. Um, yeah, so any questions so far for lead acid? Uh, this is just a fun picture of a 100 amp hour lead acid battery, sorry, 108 hour um, lead acid battery. It's an absorbed glass mat style uh, with a power supply in the box and this uh, PG40S. And then you can't quite see it, but that's actually the little under voltage lockout module. Uh, and the total weight is 74.4 pounds in this beautiful milk crate. So it gives you an idea of just how much weight you're lugging around for that amount of capacity. And I remember only 50% of that is usable. Um, so the uh, 108 amp hours is really only like 50 amp hours of usable capacity. Cool. Yeah, question? Uh, yeah, uh, Marcel, Michael Kilmore. Uh, so the, the amp hour standard, um, uh, is there uh, uh, a, uh, a standard time period that is used for uh, determining what the, what the amp hour uh, capacity of the battery is? Yeah, so the question from Michael was, uh, is there a standard for how the amp hour capacity is rated? Um, yes, there are standards, and no, not all manufacturers use them equally. So uh, use caution. Uh, you'll see batteries are often labeled by watt hours as well. Um, but when you're using amp hours, there's a very particular question, as you saw in the graph before for lead acid, there's a very large difference in what the actual capacity is based on what C rate you pull from that battery, right? Uh, so usually there'll be, if you actually have a good manufacturer and a good data sheet, the data sheet will clearly state how they rated their cell and under what conditions they rated it. And then you can do an apples to apples comparison. Um, generally online for like lead acid, it's typically kind of a one tenth C is, is typically what you're seeing or one twentieth C even is kind of their rating. So if you're planning on using like a 50 amp hour battery for a 50 amp load, you're not gonna have a good time. But if you're using it for a five amp load, you should be able to pull, you know, half of its rated capacity pretty effectively. And that's just kind of rule of thumb numbers. Yeah, very good. That's, that's uh, very helpful. Cause I've seen, I've seen uh, different manufacturers use 20 hours, uh, you know, five hours, it's all over the map. And, and then interpreting one C or 10, 10 C or a half a C is, uh, is, you know, you, as you say, you need to go back to the source. And, Absolutely. Yeah. And, and the best manufacturers will give you that data. And if they don't give you that data, it's at your own risk, right? So you might be getting a great deal, but it's actually a battery that has very poor chemistry performance for what you're trying to do. So use caution. Um, any questions from the repeater? Let me go unmute it real quick. Go ahead for the repeater. So anybody on the repeater, if you have a question, please come back with your call sign. Nada. All right. All right. We gave it seven seconds, and then we move on. All right. Next section, the one you're all been waiting for, lithium-ion batteries. Great. So lithium-ion came around in the 1970s. So it's a relatively new technology, about 100 years after lead acid came out. Um, and the key thing here that they started doing is, A, obviously different chemistry, and we'll get to that. But they started this new construction method um, of kind of jelly roll construction, which vastly increased the surface area um, available for the um, electrodes uh, at, in use for both the anode and the cathode. So in the bottom left here, this is a photo of a lithium ion uh, battery that's been unrolled. So they called a jelly roll construction, but you can literally unroll it like a Tootsie Roll pop or something all the way out. Um, and you'll have the different layers in there. So you have the anode, the cathode, the electrolyte, and the separator. And um, the separator is actually like an insulator to prevent them from shorting against each other when it's rolled on top of itself. Um, this form of construction is really, really neat and allows much, much higher energy density than lead acid. In kilojoules per kilogram, so that's a specific energy, um, that's 460 for lithium versus 140 for lead acid, roughly, right? So about 4x kind of delta for how much energy density you get um, 
which is pretty impressive. Um, there's a great video from Stranger Parts. Um, my buddy Kenneth uh, went out to a battery manufacturing company with Scotty and they did a very interesting video showing the actual manufacturing of these uh, battery styles. Uh, highly recommend it. Um, I can include the link later. Uh, that's a very interesting, it's very interesting just to see how these are manufactured. So for lithium ion, um, when we typically talk about lithium ion batteries, you'll generally hear of like a 3.6 volt nominal battery cell um, whose operating range goes from like a three volt minimum roughly to usually 4.2. That's kind of your standard run of the mill lithium ion uh, 18650 battery. Um, there are tons of different chemistries though, and this is where it gets fun, right? So you'll have um, LCO, so liquid, uh, sorry, lithium cobalt oxide, uh, nickel manganese cobalt, lithium manganese oxide, and our favorite lithium iron phosphate, LFP. Um, those are all different chemistries that have very specific applications for each of them, and they've all been tweaked and modified to give different, like to improve different characteristics based on the specific applications. So uh, for like power tools, for example, you want a really high discharge rate capability. So they're designed as power cells. So they use a different chemistry than something that wants a really high capacity for a longer runtime. So similar to the amp hour rating question earlier from Michael, uh, for lithium ion batteries, depending on the chemistry type that you use, um, it can make more sense for different types of applications. The big, the big delta being like energy storage versus power capability. Those will be in kind of opposite parks of how they are designed. Uh, typical form factors for these, the two most common that I talk about are pouch cells. So that's the photo on the bottom left. Um, that's what uh, you know is in your cell phones, in your tablets, in your handheld radios. Uh, inside your uh, RC planes, your quadcopters, whatever else. So these little battery packs that you get for your HTs, those are typically pouch cells inside. And that just gives them nice uh, energy density without any overhead. Um, for uh, the other primary form factor that you'll see is cylindrical cells. So this is commonly known as the uh, 18650, which is the very, very common um, size that's used in most laptop or older laptop batteries, I should say. So that's just this, the standard, eh, the green disappears on my screen, um, standard uh, 18650 battery um, and the 21700 being the one that's now well known for Tesla because they're making that larger form factor. Um, those numbers are actually the dimensions of those batteries. So the uh, 18 uh, millimeters diameter at one end um, and then 650 uh, long, so that's 6.5 centimeters long and 1.8 centimeters uh, diameter, which is kind of neat. So, and then 21700 equally would be slightly larger and slightly longer. Those are very common for laptops. A lot of electric, uh, or sorry, a handful of electric vehicles use them, uh, specifically Tesla, um, but things like Nissan Leaf use different um, form factors. They wouldn't actually use the cylindrical cells because they're not the most efficient for space because you have this, you know, it's a circle and circles don't pack very well. Um, and they have extra, you know, stainless steel housing and stuff around them as well. So that's kind of uh, lithium ion types. Um, lithium ion though has some challenges. The chemistry itself is very, very sensitive to over voltage and over current events that cause thermal runaway. So this is what you've all heard about in the news, um, thermal runaway or uh, spontaneous decomposition um, or whatever other terms you'd like to use are when batteries uh, no longer store the energy in a controlled fashion um, and that's usually not very uh, pleasant or very helpful for what you're trying to accomplish with your radios. Um, so as a result, you really need to have protection circuitry built into it. Um, the cells using bare lithium ion cells is extremely dangerous. Um, there are actually ad campaigns running from some of the large manufacturers now because uh, people are keeping these in their pockets for like vapes and other devices. Um, and when they get worn, you can simply short across the end of it. And it's completely unprotected and it'll dump the entire energy of this into your keys in your pocket. Um, and that's very dangerous. Um, so they need to have protection. So we'll talk about that. Um, the, they're very sensitive to over voltage. So we're talking millivolt accuracy is critical. While for lead acid, if you overcharge by like 0.1 volt or something, it's not the end of the world. For a lithium ion battery, if you overcharge by, you know, 100 millivolts, uh, it can be the difference between a stable battery and an unstable battery that you no longer can store energy in. Um, so that's really important. Uh, typically, the chargers will actually control down to the tens of millivolts or, or tighter tolerances. Um, so they actually would want to charge like 4.0 or 4.200 volts plus or minus five millivolts or something. They're, they're pretty tight. For multi-cell packs, 
So when you start stacking these batteries on top of each other, um, if you just charge them across the end, you can see that the center point will actually lose uh, lose reference, if you will, right? So your your two different cells can charge unequally, and then you can very easily hit that over voltage condition. So as a result, we need this battery management system. And this photo on the bottom left is the one I really appreciate. This is for four cells in the series. And what you'll see is you have your negative terminal on the left and then the positive terminal on the right for the entire pack. And then there's this tap in between each set of cells to make sure you can monitor the voltage across an individual set of cells. And that's the critical thing here. So this circuitry, the battery management system or PCM protection circuit module is actually monitoring individual cell voltages to make sure that under no circumstances does one of those go too high or too low. And if it ever does, it can open circuit the output and go into a safe protection state. So the minimum protections that it wants here would be over voltage protection. So that's what we just talked about. Over current protection, OCP, um, which would prevent too much discharge, which could cause them to overheat. Um, and then over temperature protection, uh, just to make sure that, again, things don't overheat. So the heat is the one of the key factors here that's a problem. Uh, did someone on the repeater have a question, or should we mute the repeater? We will mute the repeater. OK. Um, yeah, so that's here. So uh, that's the minimum protections that you need for a battery management system. Now, ideally, um, you'd include some more things in in this protection or this battery management system involving uh, under voltage lockout. So that would again protect the batteries from being over discharged. Um, you'd have actual cell balancing. So this allows when you do see miss you know differences in voltages between the different strings of cells, um, that it can help move the volt move the current between the different spots and actually uh, balance those cells. Uh, and then more advanced. Uh, battery management systems will have fuel gauging built in. So that's the actual like percentage capacity icon on your battery. Um, it's counting the, the coulombs going in and out of the battery and can very accurately determine what the percentage state of charge is. So that's what your cell phones and laptops and everything else has those built in by default. That's very common. Um, there were a couple of questions. Uh, do the pouch cells in 18650 cells have depth of discharge protection circuitry built in? Usually not. Um, so you do have protected, I don't have one here right now, but you do have protected 18650 cells, which are slightly longer and they include a little circuit board on the end of the cell that actually protects it. So if you buy um, like some of the nicer flashlights will have those um, from like Fenix and stuff. When you buy their batteries, they actually sell them as protected cells. And those are uh, very nice because they have that over voltage, over current, under voltage often built into them and makes them very safe to use um, by themselves. Um, so that's great. Uh, pouch cells uh, sometimes will also have a protection circuit module built in. So if you see like a pouch battery that's um, sold for a tablet or something, they often will have the protection circuit module on the cell itself. Um, and then we'll talk about some of the other portions as well. Uh, when we get there a little bit later. So some of that's. Okay, so pros and cons. Um, problem number one is the voltage range mismatch. And we'll get into that in detail for lithium ion, but obviously 3.6 volts doesn't multiply very nicely up to 13.8. And we'll, we'll look at that. Um, but it can be a very, very good fit for non-standard radios such as HTs. So not your 12 volt system, but in this case, uh, my little Wuxiang battery has a 7.4 volt 2600 milliamp hour battery in it. So 7.4 volts being two of these nice little cells and together they give you a nice nominal voltage that's very capable for that radio. So if the radio is specifically designed to run off lithium, it's beautiful, works very well. And then um, they design the input circuitry to match that. That's exactly what cell phones do. That's exactly what tablets and laptops do as well. Um, we talked about the hazards at high voltages. That's really key. Um, and then the life cycle. Uh, this one really depends on the chemistry, but kind of the typical numbers you'll see in data sheets is something in the you know three to 500 cycles for a battery um, to the point where it gets to about 70% of its remaining capacity. So in the bottom right here, this is a you know pulled off the internet, a Sony VTC five cell uh, with 10 amp discharge, right? So they specify that to the earlier question as well um, and a very specific discharge and charge cutoff um, requirements for the test condition. After 300 cycles, um, it's gone down, 
you know, about 600 or 500 uh, milliamp hours in capacity. So about 20% capacity reduction in 300 cycles. So they'll typically specify then, they'll give themselves a little margin and say, I as a manufacturer verify that this battery will maintain its capacity for, you know, 300 cycles and still have at least 70% remaining capacity. So that's how you'll see them typically specified. Um, the great thing is uh, they're very high energy density. So again, you can get a lot of energy in these. They're surprisingly cheap because lithium ion became very, very popular in the last kind of two decades. Um, and they're used everywhere. Almost everything has them. So they're very salvageable these days as well. Um, and you can use them for all sorts of different projects um, and find them for all sorts of different projects. Uh, some folks on the call today uh, like, you know, salvage these from all sorts of different things and uh, use them to build battery banks and packs. Um, that's what I do as well. So it's, it's pretty fun. So when we talk about lithium ion integration, this is where the voltage problem gets interesting. Um, the typical terminology we use is this um, S and P terminology, where we talk about series and parallel strings of cells. And this is really critical when you're talking about any form of uh, lithium battery. Um, when you think about our uh, lead acid battery example, a 12 volt lead acid battery would be a 6S 1P pack, right? There are six cells in series and one in parallel. And if we look at these images here on the bottom left, um, the, so the bo bottom right would be three in series and two in parallel, right? So you can see three um, in series all stacked up and then two cells in parallel. So that would double the capacity while triplicating the voltage, right? Um, or tripling the voltage. Uh, on the left, that one's actually wired up as a 3S1P, right? So that's three in series and one in parallel. But that same form factor, if you short it across the terminals, could actually be a 1S and 3P, where you have three in parallel. So it again depends on the specific needs of the system you're building for, what your target voltage is, and how you stack those, whether you need the higher voltage or whether you want the increased capacity, right? So that's where your trade-off comes. So when we actually talk about putting these in practice for mobile radios, we go back to that 13.8 volts plus or minus 15%, and we see that we have that 11.7 up to 15.9 kind of voltage range, and we need to make our batteries land in there. And this is where it becomes problematic. With three cells in series, you end at 10.8 volts nominal, right, which is already outside of that range. Um, so in order to make it usable for the radio, you need to use a boost converter. Now the problem with the low voltage pack using a boost converter means that you're running a lot of current on the lower voltage side, which would be the lithium battery side. So big wires, um, et cetera, et cetera. For 4S pack, um, it's actually quite a bit better. So your nominal voltage is right in the middle there. So 14.4, uh, the low end when they drop to low voltage at three volts a cell, that would be 12 volts um, for the whole pack. Um, the only problem is at the upper end, if you fully charge that pack to every cell up to 4.2 volts in this case, you'd get to 16.8, right? And that's too high for a lot of radios. If you actually hook that up um, as is to your mobile radios, you will likely damage the input um, depending on the specific radio. And this is a big caution because online you can go and buy nice RC lithium polymer packs for 14.4 uh, volt packs. And you're like, oh great, I'll buy that for my radio. And you buy the charger for it, you charge it to 16.8, plug your beautiful HF rig into it, and then you just fried the input to your HF rig if it wasn't capable of 16.8. So I have seen people use these in practice for amateur radio um, if their equipment allows it, or you can actually undercharge it a little bit. So if you don't charge up to 4.2 volts per cell, but you only charge up to like 3.95 volts per cell, um, you don't exceed that maximum voltage, so you can safely plug it into all your amateur radio gear but you lose about 20, 10 to 20% of available capacity. So that's a trade-off that you can do. Um, but I have seen people do this and it is very feasible since you can salvage the cells and make some low cost options. So that's kind of nice. And then you can go to larger um, packs with more than five cells. So with five cells, your nominal voltage is already too high. Um, so you need to have some sort of buck converter to bring that voltage in there. Now, as soon as I say buck or boost converters, most people that do any HF on this call are going to immediately get really upset and go, oh, those convert switching regulators are what cause noise on the HF bands. I'm not going to use those. Um, and they have an efficiency hit. Um, absolutely true on both cases. And it also kind of depends on how you use them. Um, so we have some numbers later from, from one of the ones that I played with. But there are buck converters that you can pay more for that are not a problem for HF. Um, and there are ones that have uh, upper 90th percentile efficiency. So it's just a matter of finding the right things. 
Um, if you go on eBay or Amazon and just buy the cheapest one that you find for a golf cart, it's not going to be optimized for HF performance or for efficiency. It's going to be optimized for cost, right? So that's a trade-off that you have to make. Um, this is kind of a summary slide of what we were looking at. So the first column here would be the mobile radio voltage. So that's that 11.7, 15.9. That's that 13.8 plus or minus 15. You can see the lead acid range with the lower end of lead acid drops out the bottom of the radios. With a 3S battery, you're already below that. So you only have like 10% of the capacity that's in range. With a 4S battery, we have this, you know, 10 to 20% capacity that's about the top. So we can either undercharge or we can put a buck regulation on there. Um, and then for a 5S or larger, um, you can see how it's already pushing up uh, above the kind of nominal range of, of that 13.8 volt radio. So that, that really depends on how you want to use it and what you want to do, um, but it's very feasible. So to actually build these, you take a battery pack, you take a battery management system, and then you add a buck or a boost converter, um, which these are pictures, of, they all look pretty similar depending on whether you build a 3S, a 4S, or a greater than 4S pack. Um, on the bottom here, this is actually a, a 7S pack, uh, which gets you up to kind of a 24 volt uh, kind of range uh, with the battery management system. Um, and that's exactly what I did. So uh, this is a DIY Powerwall battery pack that I built. Um, actually, Justin Kenny is on the call today. So he helped do the layout for this board, um, KJ6KST. Um, and that's built into this nice little case that you can see in the picture as well, uh, and filled with lots of batteries on the inside. So uh, this is a 7S 10P pack. So that's 70 18650 uh, lithium ion batteries inside uh, with a total capacity around 26 amp hours um, or 650 watt hours, um, depending on how you want to do your math. Now, since this is, uh, we wanted to use it for 13.8 volt uh, radio usage, uh, we might as well hook it up to 13.8 volt output. So uh, we simply add a, DC to DC converter. In this case, I rank, rank, rated it at 30 amps so that I can easily run an HF rig and a mobile rig um, at the same time uh, and have that on the output. So on the front of the box, we have a nice little switch that we just turn on that boost converter, um, which will then turn on your power pole and your USB ports on the side uh, and everything runs hunky dunky dory. So pretty straightforward, uh, works surprisingly well. Uh, and yeah, it's pretty neat. Uh, it's expensive. So uh, buying the kit and if you're buying the cells, uh, you're looking at like 600 something dollars for a 26 amp hour battery. So it's not exactly the most um, uh, cost effective solution, but it's very, very capable. Um, I actually have plans to use this for like a 24 volt inverter system because you can get better efficiency when you're not um, boosting as high um, for an AC inverter. Uh, and it's generally just, kind of fun to have around. I have a nice uh, battery battery monitor on the top, which gives you exact readouts for um, current and voltage and amp hours and watt hours and everything. Uh, there we go. OK, I'm back. Yes. OK, that happened once before. Um, so it gives you a nice little readout for uh, just using it for anything that you might want to do, which is really kind of fun. Uh, that's the inside. That's the system. It's pretty much it. The pack weighs about 16 pounds. So it's not the lightest thing, but I put it in a nice case um, very carefully. Didn't want it to get damaged if it gets thrown around. Again, the cells themselves are unprotected, but this design is very nice. Um, each board has its own fuse on it. The overall output has fusing on it. Um, and the individual balance leads running between them are all fused as well. So it's actually a very nice design uh, that has quite a, quite a few little details in it that make it uh, nice for a relatively safe system. Um, for the actual uh, efficiencies, uh, again, this was a 30 amp uh, buck converter. And you can see that at low current rating, so at running at about one amp, we're getting around 87% efficiency, um, which is about, which is, pretty understandable when you're running in a bigger converter at lower, much, much lower than its rated level. Um, but once you're pulling closer to its ratings, so around 22 amps, we're getting in the upper 90s, 96 percentile for efficiency. So from an efficiency perspective, it's actually not that big of a hit if you're using it for loads. Now, if you're just using this to charge your cell phone, um, it's not going to be the most efficient. You're probably going to lose more just with the idle current of the thing sitting there um, than actually running up, you know, five or 10 watts into your cell phone or 15 watts into your cell phone. 
So uh, trade-offs, but that can be helpful. Cool. Um, and then my favorite thing is running a discharge test. So this is using the uh, uh, computerized battery analyzer from West Mountain Radio. Um, and it's kind of funny because again, we're measuring this at the 13.8 volt output because that was my goal here. So it's regulated 13.8s because when you can pick your regulator, you might as well put it right in the middle of what your target voltage is. So it's a nice flat line all the way across, all the way across, all the way across until the regulator cuts out and then it turns off, right? Which is kind of hilarious, but the math actually worked out. So we were, we were pulling about five amps, which should be roughly 90% efficient um, based on the earlier math we did on the previous slide. So we ran for about 8.7 hours which uh, if you did the math on the cells themselves, you should have gotten to 590 watt hours and we actually measured around 608 watt hours. So that was really cool. Um, it's nice when the, the math actually works out and it matches kind of the expectation. Okay, any questions on lithium ion so far? And I'll unmute the repeater as well in case anyone would like to jump in. All right, so as a reminder, if you are listening to the uh, park repeater and you have a question, uh, please just come back with your call. Uh, yes, I have a, a question. Uh, solar, ahead, Dan. Uh, solar charging, are you going to... Sorry, you got muted, Dan. Do you want to unmute? There you go. Oh, okay. No, my question was about solar charging uh, for some of these battery packs. Uh, have you uh, explored that as yet with some of the larger packs? Yeah, so from a solar charging perspective, um, it's, I've got a whole nother talk on that we can get some other time. Uh, but, but the short version is, uh, yes, it's just a matter of matching the right uh, solar panel and charge controller to the batteries that you're trying to charge. Um, many charge controllers will have options for setting the nominal battery voltage that you're going for. So even if you build like a 7S pack, um, it's pretty similar to a 24 volt lead acid system. So as long as that charge controller has customization to uh, optimize the voltages and the charge rates for the specific battery system that you're using, which is pretty typical for a decent start charge controller, um, then it's not a problem. Uh, and it could even be a buck boost, or sorry, it could be a PWM uh, charge controller that can uh, boost up a lower voltage um, panel, um, but you'd be better off with a higher voltage panel. So a panel that's, you know, 36 volts or something or more uh, that to feed into like this battery, for example, um, which I think that top voltage, the voltage range that we're talking about is 21 to 29.4 volts for the actual pack itself. Um, and that's that's the charge voltage. So the charger I have for that is a 29.4 volt, uh, like actually an e-bike charger that you can just get off of eBay uh, to charge electric bikes and scooters. They're pretty common in that kind of range. Cool. All right. Any other questions? I think that got that. All right, now the fun part, lithium iron phosphate. Okay, so uh, this one has a whole bunch of different names. So uh, LIFEPO is one of them. That's L-I-F-E-P-O-4. That's for lithium iron and phosphate or L-F-P for lithium ferrophosphate. Um, all the same thing, but you'll hear different terms. So just get that out of the way. Um, these are a little bit later in development. They came around in 1996 uh, approximately. Uh, so 1970 was when we had lithium ion come around as a chemistry. And then lithium iron phosphate is a specific uh, subgenre of those. Um, was in 1996. So it's the same, generally it's the same general jelly roll construction is pretty common. Um, it's a different kind of form factor. So this one here on the screen is actually a 26650. So it's slightly fatter, but the same length as an 18650. Um, and the key thing here that we care about for today's presentation is that this different chemistry gives us a different nominal voltage, right? So uh, for lithium iron phosphate, it's a 3.2 volt nominal um, which ranges from kind of 2.5 volts per cell up to 3.65 versus the kind of 3 volts to 4.2 volts of a standard lithium ion chemistry. So with a 4S pack now, we're getting from 10 to 14.6, which is very nicely in that 11.7 to 15.9 range. Um, and that's what's so useful um, for this chemistry. So when we actually look at that um, on the chart again, right? So here's this kind of lithium iron phosphate column added to the end. Um, and it sits very nicely here in that mobile radio range. Uh, 
with the last kind of only about five or maybe 10% of capacity is actually gonna be down here this low, maybe not even that high, it could only be like one or 2% of actual capacity is below this kind of 11 volt range. Um, so that's, that's really nice. Um, we'll show you the discharge graphs later, but you'll see that this is actually a very small portion of the capacity of the battery. The majority of the time it's sitting right here in kind of the 13, 13.2, 13.6 volt range, which makes it perfect for amateur radio. And that's why everyone's so excited about these. So the nice thing is in the last about five years, they become extremely available as 12 volt battery replacements. So that's uh, for automotive, you can buy lithium batteries for replacements for automotive, for motorcycle batteries, um, and for amateur radio. Uh, typically when you buy these packs, so like in the bottom right here, this is one of the packs from BioNO, which is one of the really uh, popular brands for amateur radio lithium iron phosphate use. Um, these come fully built in with protection modules in them. So PCMs, that's what we talked about earlier, or uh, BMS, the battery management system that's built in. So these have over voltage protection, over temperature protection, under voltage lockout and um, over current protection all built in. Um, and most of them have balancing built in as well. So this picture on the bottom left, that's actually taken at Pacificon from the folks at BioNO. And that's one of their actual battery management boards on top of their um, battery pack. So again, using our knowledge from this talk, this pack here is a 4S 2P battery pack, right? Four in series and two in parallel um, with the protection circuit module on top. So uh, when you actually read the data sheets for BioNO, they'll tell you that the balancing occurs only at the top end. So they do top end balancing and they'll tell you every once in a while, like leave the battery plugged in for, you know, at least a couple hours once it's fully charged to allow the battery to kind of self to balance itself. Um, especially on first use. And if you're using it a lot or cycling it a lot, you may want to do that more often. Um, and again, similar to lead acid, it's a direct hookup to most radios. So you'll notice this battery on the back bottom right actually has power pole connectors directly on it. So you can literally plug it in directly behind your radio, um, you know, lop off the T connector on the back of the radio and just put a power pole directly on it like we've all done anyway. Um, and you can just plug the radio directly in there. So that's really, really nice. Um, a couple other really useful thing. So uh, generally lithium iron phosphate is intrinsically safer chemistry than other lithium ions. So that means that the electrolytes used and the actual kind of flash point of all the chemistry involved, um, it's much, much, much more difficult to get these to um, spontaneously decombust um, or decompose themselves, right? So that's, that's a nice thing about lithium iron phosphate. Uh, they can withstand higher temperatures a little bit better. Um, they have a much higher cycle life, generally speaking. So uh, you can get lithium iron phosphate chemistries that have thousands of cycles that they're rated for as opposed to just hundreds. So um, you can typically find lithium iron phosphate packs that are, you know, two or 3000 cycles um, as opposed to just, you know, the 500 cycles uh, uh, for lead acid or for a lithium ion, lithium ion battery. Um, and that's particularly useful in cycling applications like an off-grid solar installation uh, where 500 cycles is only like a year and a bit, a year and a half maybe of, of lifetime versus, you know, two to 3000 cycles is, you know, five, 10 years of usage from that battery in the same kind of environment. So that's really interesting. Uh, they generally have lower self discharge and better aging. So it's kind of all related to the cycle life as well, but the, uh, the chemistry doesn't uh, like discharge itself too much. So if you let the let lithium ion phosphate battery sit for six months, it usually is, pretty close to the same capacity that you left it. It might've gone down a couple percent um, versus like your phone or your, your laptop computer in that same six month period, it might've dropped 10 or 20% um, of capacity depending on kind of the chemistry and how old the battery is as well. Um, of course, with all these wonderful benefits, I am not a snake oil salesman. There are drawbacks as well. So there's uh, lower energy density. So it's about 360 kilojoules per kilogram versus 460. So you'll lose some energy density. Um, so that means that it's a slightly larger battery for the same amount of um, available power. Um, and of course it has to be more expensive. So a lithium iron phosphate battery compared to lead acid is something in the kind of the four times the cost range. I um, mean, compared to lithium ion is going to be about twice the cost for similar capacity. But this is kind of just raw cell pricing that I'm listing here. So that doesn't necessarily include all the details of, you know, uh, the protection circuitry that you're putting in there or not for like lead acid, um, the different chargers and how much those cost, the case you're putting it in, uh, the buck or boost converter, converter you'd need for the lithium ion battery potentially. Um, so you really have to look at your specific application to make that cost trade off. Um, but generally speaking, lithium iron phosphate is a very, very good choice for these. Um, 
So when you want to play with lithium iron phosphate, you have kind of two options. One is build a pack and the other is buy a pack. So we'll start with buy a pack. Um, bio, I know we had already talked about, they're very, very popular just for a you know, lead acid drop-in replacement. Um, they have the protections built in, they have a battery management system built in, um, and the charger that you can just check a box and order the charger that comes with that battery from them works great. Simple red green light on it, charges at the rate that's good for that battery, um, and it just works. So if you just want a simple off the shelf solution to just start using a really cool battery for your radio and be the hot talk at the next um, uh, in person field day or soda event, uh, then go get yourself a nice little uh, lead acid or a lithium iron phosphate battery. Um, other brands uh, make, there are a whole bunch of other brands, especially these days, a lot of very popular ones. Uh, in the solar world, the uh, Battleborn batteries, uh, and then a whole bunch of Chinese brands and the Cald and a number of others make some interesting drop-in replacements as well for um, lead acid, uh, which is uh, really, makes them really available and has made the pricing more competitive in the last couple of years. So you can definitely look around. So if we do that example, we go buy ourselves a 12 volt, uh, 20 amp hour lithium iron phosphate battery, like the one shown here in the picture. Um, it's about 192 bucks off of BioNO's website. Um, I bought a hard case a charger for it, USB and power pole ports um, for about a hundred bucks and then made this nice little box. So this is a nice little Pelican box, weighs about nine and a half pounds with all the cables and other things in it. Um, and it's really useful, it just has all the parts in it, um, has a nice little voltage display, which isn't as useful for um, lithium iron phosphate, like I said, because it's a pretty flat discharge curve. So it doesn't really tell you how much capacity you have. Um, but it is one of the best debug tools, right? If, if we ever have a power problem in the amateur radio world, the first thing you do is pull out your multimeter. So effectively all this is is just a multimeter permanently hooked up to the battery with a button to see what the voltage is, right? And that's a really handy thing. You can get those modules for a couple bucks from eBay. So highly recommend putting that on, on anything. Um, in the actual box, what's great is that I can include the charger. Um, my parents actually have it right now, so I can't show you. I also keep uh, some adapters in there. I keep some, uh, a power meter in there, a little uh, power pole extension cable, and then adapters from 2.5 millimeter uh, back and forth to power pole as well. So you can use these different ports on the front. Um, and most importantly, keep some USB cables in there because when you need to charge your phone or your friend's phone, chances are they won't have the cable with them, but you have this beautiful battery bank and a phone and nothing to hook the two together. So always, always, always keep a little charging cable in every single battery bank box that you ever make, period no ifs, ands, or buts. That's a hard requirement for making these. Um, yeah, so here's the discharge test. Again, like we mentioned, it's pretty flat, right? So uh, when, it, when it starts right at the beginning, you'll see that 14.6 volts is very brief. So if you're looking at this, this is kind of your 100% capacity all the way down to 0% capacity. The first, I don't know, that's not even like a percent or two, you're already down at you know, 13 volts right away. In this for this particular battery. And this includes a little bit of voltage drop through some cables, right? Um, but you'll see how flat this is all the way out to like 80, 90% when it starts dropping off. And then this last couple percent is actually when it drops off the cliff. So this is that hockey stick at the end where the voltage actually drops very rapidly at the end of the um, remaining capacity of the lithium iron phosphate battery. Um, so this is, this is really characteristic of lithium iron phosphate. And as a result, that little voltmeter that I had on there um, it only has one degree, one voltage point of accuracy, right? So if I told you that that one was reading 12.8 volts, what would the capacity of my battery be using this graph, right? So let's go, okay, 12.5, 12.8, that's somewhere here. So I don't know, 50% plus or minus 20%. Right, that's about like the accuracy you can get from that sort of measurement. And that again, depends on the voltage drop of the cables and where you're measuring and that sort of thing. So as you can see, it's not really the most useful thing to just use raw voltage for these, which is where having a fuel gauging um, protection circuit module or battery management system um, is very, very useful. So um, that's something to think about when you're looking at these sorts of batteries. Um, the other call out was, yeah, if you don't want to build your own box, um, there are lots of options out there. PowerWorks has some, uh, eBay sells a bunch. You can get these pre-built with like with options to drop them in. Uh, the local ham fests when they're running have these as well. Um, but I really liked building my own just cause you can really customize it for what you really want, which is kind of nice. So I wanted, you know, some basic USB A ports on it. I wanted this voltmeter. I wanted just one set of power poles and a nice switch on the side. So you can just find those parts. And if you're not particularly picky about time frame. 
you can order stuff pretty cheaply from overseas, um, or you can get nice high quality fast stuff from local manufacturers. Um, uh, you'll just be paying a premium, of course, for, for those. So that's if you buy a pack. So now the fun one is building a pack. So if you build your own lithium iron phosphate pack, this is where the real fun begins. Um, this is the rat hole that I went down in the last kind of six months. Um, and it gets really exciting. So when, when we talk about that customization for the box itself, um, the battery is just as much a customization for what you want as well, right? Now, um, battery nerds like myself and some of the other people on this call get really excited about this and would love to spend lots of time kind of figuring out the batteries and figuring out what they want to do. Um, but others might be perfectly happy just buying one off the shelf, right? Uh, so it really depends on what you want to do. For me, I wanted to do one of these as a proof of concept. Um, and PowerWorks gave me this nice bright orange box at uh, Pacificon when I gave this talk for originally. Um, and they were like, hey, do you want one of these? And I said, sure, that sounds like a great idea. So I ended up with one of these beautiful orange boxes. And I said, well, I have this beautiful orange box. I already own two battery packs. So I really don't need another one, but it's a great excuse to go spend some money and build another lithium iron phosphate battery. So that's what we did. Um, I went online, found a nice deal on some 50 amp hour prismatic cells. So those are uh, similar to the regular cylindrical cells, except they're kind of squished flat and then put into an aluminum housing. So that's these kind of square, um, kind of book-shaped um, blue uh, cased battery cells. Um, and I bought an eight pack actually for like 400 bucks and split it with my buddy. Um, so if you go to Kenneth uh, Finnegan's blog, W6KWF, he's got his write-up um, on the battery pack that he built with the same cells. And you can see how we ended up in different spots based on what we both wanted. Um, for me, I wanted a smart battery management system. So this was really my big thing, is I wanted a really neat way to talk to the battery and know what's going on. Um, we'll show you some pictures of that in a minute. Um, but that costs a little bit more. So I got a nice smart BMS with a Bluetooth module so my phone can talk to it. And that cost about 73 bucks versus, you know, 20 bucks, you can get a simple module that just does the protection that you need, um, but doesn't give you like the communication and the configurability that, that this one does. Um, then get some sort of case. Um, like I said, this PowerWorks Mega Box was gifted to me, but you could easily build one or um, make one with your own thing, um, and then figure out what charger makes sense for you as well. So you kind of always have to think about all these little pieces that add up. Um, yes, you can use your benchtop power supply to charge it um, carefully. If you have a good protection module in there, then it'll protect against, like, if you accidentally turn that knob, that one turn pot that goes from zero to 60 volts, if you turn it an 18th of a turn and it goes up three volts, that would blow up an unprotected cell, but a protected cell should protect itself. So you have to be kind of careful with that. Um, in my case, like I said, the BioNO um, chargers are just really useful and they work really nice. I went with the six amp hour one um, purely because it fits in the box very nicely. So it sits right there and it, the length of that six amp hour one, uh, six amp charger fits perfectly. The 10 amp charger was too big for this box. So I said, yeah, we'll just go with the six amp one because I really like keeping everything in that one box together. So this whole box cost about 506 bucks. The battery itself, that's what you see in the top right picture, um, is just shy of $300. And that same battery from like Bioeno, for example, for a 50 amp hour pre-built with the battery management system in it is about $470. So you can save yourself some money if you're looking around and buying the right things. Um, but I mean, there are a couple extra parts that I don't count in there, like the crimps that I have in my tool shop, in my tool shed, um, and you know, the extra SB50, the larger Anderson power pole connectors, um, you need to have those on in stock or you have to go buy a pack of those. So those are little things that you need to consider if you're building your own. Um, and those do all add to the cost. I don't count the zip ties in this, right? But um, some people may add that to their bill of materials. Um, I do have a write up on this on Twitter. So uh, you guys can um, take a look at that later uh, and as well. So that's the inside of this one. Um, I just use some foam to hold stuff in place, some double sided Velcro on the bottom. This is the Bluetooth module right up top with the wire, the antenna wire wrapped around here. So I get pretty good range. I can talk to this from across the house um, and see what its capacity is, adjust the parameters and all that, which is really good fun. Um, it's super, super interesting. Um, and true to my word, uh, I do have my little pouch inside and that pouch contains uh, all the USB cables you could ever need because um, you need to keep those USB cables around uh, when you need to charge someone's phone. Um, and that's, that's super helpful. Uh, so yeah, quick aside on the actual uh, battery management system. So this is the, some screenshots from the actual uh, uh, Android app that runs with this uh, smart BMS. Um, really, really, really powerful. So for the battery nerds out there, this is absolute dreamland because I can sit here and 
<laughs> sit on the couch and pull out my phone and go look at my battery stats and go, oh, great, my cells are pretty well in balance. You know, they're all within, you know, 10 millivolts of each other. That's great. Oh, 16 millivolts. Maybe I should go look at that one. Uh, my total capacity, my current, my voltage. I can turn on and off the battery pack remotely. I can monitor the active current and uh, really useful. I get an actual percentage readout here of the battery capacity and it's very accurate. Um, I've done some benchmarking with that against um, my discharger um, and that gets a very good accurate number. So you can sit there during field day, pull out your phone app and go, oh, I've got exactly, you know, 22% left on this battery. Based on my runtime, I'll be able to run for another, you know, two and a half hours before I need to charge this up or swap out batteries or something. So that's super helpful. Um, and you can configure everything. So uh, again, if this is your dream, then uh, you'll love having a smart battery management system. But you can mess it up if you don't configure these things correctly. We talked about those voltages, they are critical. So if you configure these incorrectly for your battery, you'll have an unhappy time. So make sure you read the manual and uh, don't necessarily use the defaults. And yeah, quick aside here, we're almost done, don't worry. Um, this is the actual discharge curve for this. So we again hooked up the battery um, CBA, the computerized battery analyzer. Um, with a, an extra fan on it just because power electronics like being cool. So uh, two fans are better than one. Uh, the discharge curve here, again, very, very flat most of the way down. And then that kind of tank off at the end, uh, measured capacity of around 52 and a half amp hours for that whole pack. So that's right on the money as well. Um, but again, that same characteristic initial voltage drop right from 14.6 down to like a 13 volts. Um, and then all the way down to about 11 volt when the battery did a cutoff um, to protect itself. Um, the other cool thing that I just played with was this uh, USB-C PD controller. So that's what you see in the left picture here. Um, that's a 60 watt USB-C port that I added. The one that's built into the um, box only is 15 watts for like a cell phone. But with the 60 watt one, you can run a laptop off it. So this battery bank is very useful for running uh, uh, any laptop that has a USB-C PD port on it uh, at up to 60 watts, which is really, really useful um, and a great way to um, just go out into the field and use your battery for something besides powering a radio. All right. And then we'll finish up real quick. So the comparison table here at the end, lead acid, we talked about a lot of those. They're heavy, they're cheap, they work pretty well for 12 volts. Um, and they're there. Uh, lithium ion, uh, generally, not the best solution, great energy density, pretty good cost, but integration is very difficult for amateur radio usage. So generally not great. Um, some more concerns about safety as well and just not um, the best match for what we need. And lithium iron phosphate, which yes, is expensive and still needs a lot of protection, but is great because you can hook it up directly to the radios. The weight's not really a problem um, and it just works really, really well. So um, if there's one thing that you learn from today's talk, it's uh, lithium iron phosphate is a great choice for amateur radio. Um, and yes, any radio sites that I'm deploying in the future are planning on using lithium iron phosphate, um, especially for off-grid sites uh, as it's making sense now. And there are a lot of good options available online for um, those sorts of batteries. So that ends the talk for today. Um, and we'll stick around with all sorts of questions uh, either in the chat or here. Uh, and address anything else you guys might want. Uh, the presentation is already posted to my QRZ. This slightly updated presentation is not there yet. I will post it eventually. Um, and I've got a couple of nice resources at the end with some great YouTube channels, some other websites, and a bunch of references if you'd like to read through those. Um, so those will be available there.